Hello, Life Point friends and family. Thank you for joining us today. If you're new, welcome to the family. May God's message find its way to you no matter where you are. Enjoy the service. Morning, Life Point. If you were new, welcome to the family. We're going to start our time together today by singing three songs to celebrate God's love for us. If you care to join, please do so. Let's go. Swallowed by pride, but out of the darkness you brought me to your light. You showed me new mercy and opened up my eyes. From the day you saved my soul. My heart would overflow From the day you 
Somebody with a hurt that I could have helped Somebody with a hand that I could have helped When I just can't see past myself Lord, help me be A little more like mercy A little more like grace A little more like kindness Goodness, love and faith A little more like patience A little more like peace A little more like Jesus little less like me yeah. yeah there's no denying I have changed I've been safe from who I used to be but even at my best I must confess I still need help to see the way you see Somebody with a hurt that I could have helped Somebody with a hand that I could have helped When I just can't see past myself Lord, help me be A little more like mercy A little more like grace A little more like kindness Goodness, love and faith A little more like patience A little more like peace A little more like Jesus Little less like me On oh, be the beggar on the street Love to be our hands and feet Freely give what I receive Lord help me be I want to put you first above all else Love my neighbor as myself In the moments no one sees Lord help me be more like mercy, little more like grace, little more like kindness, goodness, love and faith, little more like patience, little more like peace, little more like Jesus, little less like me, little more like living, everything I preach, little more like Jesus. Little less like me
Thank you so much, God, for everything. Thank you for having us here today and to worship you. It's all about you. It's not about us. It's all about you. And God, I'd like to pray for the people of Cuba, the people of Puerto Rico, and the people of Florida and South Carolina. I pray for, for all the families that have lost loved ones um, with the terrible storm. And I pray that you'll provide all the resources necessary to uplift those folks that are in dire need right now. They're certainly in more dire need than us. Um, I pray for every single one of us that you know, we'll receive the Lord's message today and that it'll, it'll just pierce our heart and we'll just be so blessed today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Good morning, LifePoint friends and family. We're so happy that you're here with us today. And if this is your first time joining, we would love for you to text hello to the number on the screen so that we can connect with you. And if you have any prayer requests, anything that you have going on in your life that you want us to pray with you about, please text that to the same number and you will be added to our prayer request list. Enjoy the service and God bless. Most people think a church is all about what happens on the stage every weekend, but we know it goes way beyond that. There's that woman who faithfully holds babies in the nursery week in and week out. Plus, there's that couple who gently leads younger couples, helping them figure out all that a marriage really can be. Plus, there's that guy who's always up for driving a minivan full of teenagers to their next youth event. Plus, there are key leaders who make visionary decisions about the direction of the church and are just fine with serving outside of the spotlight. Plus, the guys and gals who run sound and make sure that the right words are on the screen at the right time. Plus, the good people filling the seats who may or may not have their act all together. Side note, no one has their act all together. Add to that the man who arrived early today to pray with anticipation over every empty seat. A seat that would be filled by you today. We could go on, but you get the idea. When these less than perfect people are all added together, we're left with a special place full of special people. It's a group of people who are all figuring out how best to follow Jesus so that our lives leave his residue behind in every location and in every conversation. And somewhere in the middle of all this imperfection, we believe that God is smiling and that the bride of Christ is being revealed as beautiful and redemptive in spite of her flaws. And together, we're becoming something that God simply calls church. So can we count you in? I think everybody has somebody that's a friend or a family member that used to be a part of church, but they're not now. For whatever reason, they're no longer following Jesus. Maybe they're not hostile, but maybe they're just indifferent, but hey, they're not in person or online at the moment, and you're not expecting them to be there next week. Why is that? Well, everybody has a reason for what they do. Sometimes they're in touch with that reason, sometimes they're not. What we want to do is help people reconnect. There are all, there are all these kind of really good reasons why we struggle. I don't know, I've got reasons, you've got reasons, they have reasons. And it's sometimes a real risk trying to bring those reasons out. Because in the process, if we try to do that, we can make them uncomfortable. And once we make somebody uncomfortable, basically you've shut the conversation down. So how do you, how do you bring up something like that with somebody without making them feel uncomfortable? What a challenge. We started a series last week. On, basically, it's about deconstruction. It's a word that's in common use today. It's kind of a new word. I don't know that I heard it before 10 years ago, and I especially hear it a lot more in the last few years. It's a word that people use to say that they kind of taking all they believe and taking it apart, deconstructing it, taking, you know, they're looking back and saying, you know, hey, I, w I grew up in a family with friends and we believe this. But do I believe that? And why do I believe that? 
And they also, they're looking at their lifestyle. You know, they see friends with a different lifestyle than what they have. And so they're wondering, well, I don't know, maybe the lifestyle I picked is not the best one. And so they kind of, well, toss out their lifestyle and try on a new one. And in the process, they, well, they say, I just don't know. I'm associated with this group and this group, and I'm associated with the church. And I'm not so, why am I, you know, why am I associated with any of these people? And so they begin to take a look at where they are and what they think and why they think it. Sometimes it's a really quick process that's not really done well. And sometimes the end result is not good from our perspective, a Christian perspective, because people will literally just kind of either slowly drift away from Jesus and the church or they'll make a radical turn away from Jesus and the church. It doesn't have to be that way. In fact, one of the things I like to do is to put people in a position where they have to deconstruct. You say, oh my gosh, you can't be serious. Yes, I am serious because here's the thing. I want you to reach the point where you believe it because you believe it, not because your parents said it, not because I said it, but because it's true and that you're convinced of it. Now, I went through a deconstruction period and I came out dramatically better because I was associated with other people that you could ask questions and they would answer your questions. They would help you. They were people who were serious about walking with Jesus and questions. Hey, let's talk. And that, in, in that kind of environment, it's a lot of fun because you don't, you're not afraid. You're just, you've got this open environment where any questions, okay, and you can just talk and you say, well, you know, this is what I think right now. And if, if someone thinks differently, you don't feel threatened. You just say, okay, you think that? Well, okay, why do you think that? But if you don't get into that kind of environment, then what happens is, is you'll make a statement. They'll make a statement. You'll feel like you need to defend it. They'll ask you a question you can't handle. You'll get defensive. You'll think, I don't like this conversation. I want out of this conversation. And so you'll try to shut it down and get out of there some, in some size, shape, or form. And even if you're a Christian, you might sometimes run from it because you think, well, they're going to ask me a question. I don't know the answer. Now I feel threatened. You know what? If, so, if you ask me a question, you know, you know what I feel? I feel like I'd like to go see if I can find out the answer. I don't have all the answers. Nobody has all the answers. We're all in the process of learning and growing. And so last week, what I was trying to do is help you realize that it is nothing new for a person to go through a process of what is now called deconstruction. It's nothing new. And in also this, it's normal. Think about it. If you've got a little five-year-old and you bring them to church, you teach them about Jesus, they reach a certain point where they hear people, they, they have family and friends and education systems maybe that are not friendly to that, and so they speak against it. And so at that particular point, it needs to transition from your faith to their faith. It needs to be something that becomes theirs. We want our children to have their own personal faith in Jesus, to trust Jesus for who he says he is and what he says he wants to do. I don't want it to be based on mama's faith. I want it to be based on their faith. And this can be a really healthy process if it's done right in the right kind of environment. And it is just exactly that, a process. It's not something that just happens, well, quickly. It shouldn't anyway. Because you're, as you're growing up, you're in what we call the, well, the construction part of it, where you're learning things and you're probably following your, the faith of your family and friends and the church group you're associated with are the opposite. You're... A, you're following the non-faith and the non-church involvement of people that you're associated with, your family and friends. And so at some point, you can deconstruct from having no idea that, about Jesus, Christianity, the Bible, any of that. And so you can think, you're, you start asking yourself questions. Now, why do I not think there's any validity to who Jesus said he was? And so they start deconstructing from well, it could be atheism, agnosticism, or the fact that I just never even thought about it. The whole process of construction is what you get as you're growing up. Then you reach that point 
at different points in life, teenage, 20s, 30s. I don't know, maybe you're there now. Maybe you're 85 and you're there. It could be at any point in your life. And if you do it well, there'll be a final phase, which is a reconstruction phase, where it becomes yours and you know why you believe what you believe. And it's solid with you. And you've done the work. You know. Threatening? It can be. But you also, what I hope, is that the ultimate outcome is you have a new commitment to what you believe. And you know it, and you know why. Now, today, though, I want to talk about one of the areas that people have a tendency to deconstruct from, and it's church, being associated with a group like a local church. And it's not any big secret why they would struggle. (laughs) I just thought just for, well, for fun, that's the wrong word. Uh, I was curious what would come up if I started Googling, you know, pastors that got in trouble or churches that got in trouble. And well, apparently some, it's it's always going to make the news. uh, Some pastor in New York was speaking and a couple of ladies, I guess, were I don't know why they were mad at him. It didn't say, but. But they were in the back and they started standing up and shouting at him. And apparently they weren't using church kind of appropriate words in their conversation while he was trying to speak. He tried to get them to stop. They wouldn't. And so he literally went back and talked to them. They wouldn't stop. And so he decided to push them out of the auditorium. (laughs) Wasn't a good idea. But anyway, because he manhandled them out of the auditorium, they pressed charges they got the police riled up enough that they actually arrested the pastor. He was, he was in custody for two hours. Then they dismissed all the charges because that's really not a good thing to get charged over anyway. Obviously, everybody kind of lost their cool. They messed up. That made national news. Now, that's ridiculous that that would make national news, but it did. Now, there are some things that are worthy of national news. When you hear about a church that are groups of churches that covered up sexual abuse, or somebody did something financially inappropriate. I was reading also this week about some pastor in Florida that used the money that was handed out by, you know, for COVID to buy himself a new Mercedes. He got arrested. Now, the truth of the matter is that a lot of people that did that, they'll never make the news, but he did. It won't make the news for the other thousand pastors who did what they should do. And we're helping people through the pandemic or the other thousand churches that were doing wonderful things to help people through the pandemic. They're not going to make the news because that's boring. But it's under, I can see why somebody would, you know, if, if they had a personal bad experience or they heard that kind of thing, why they'd want to just wash their hands of the whole deal and say, ah, I'm done with it. Now, sometimes that's an excuse. Sometimes they really, you know, it's very complicated, all the different reasons that people walk away. And so it's like, I, it's like I can't share everything in one sentence or one message about all the different reasons people would do it. Sometimes, sometimes they do it because they just got hurt by somebody who's a Christian and they just, they're, you know, this... They just, they were badly treated by somebody that went postal on them, so to speak. Excuse me, all you postal workers. But anyway, somebody that did something like that to them. Or it could be because they just liked doing wrong and they needed an excuse to keep doing that wrong. So they had to back away. Or it could be just a a spiritual thing. There really is a God and there really are fallen angels. And those fallen angels really are at work trying to distract you and to get you to be not involved in a local church. So there's spiritual Warfare, you might call it, spiritual battles that are taking place. It's complicated. But I can tell you this. I've seen all of that. And I can just tell you, I love the local church. I have no hesitation in saying I love you. I, you say you don't know me. Some of you I don't know real well. You're right. Some of you that are watching online I've never met. But I love you. 
How can that be? It's because God's given me a love for people to care about people. And, that's, and other people in our church, they, they, they love you too and they care about you. And we've, we've seen the, the incredible good that can be done in and through a local church. And besides that, if some knucklehead pastor in Florida uses his COVID money to buy a Mercedes, what does that got to do with Jesus? You think Jesus wanted him to do that? No, that has nothing to do with Jesus or the church he established or the purpose of the church. That's not, that has nothing to do with it. So it's the opposite of what Jesus would want him to do. And when we look in the Bible and we see the, the original church, what we see is a bunch of people who had a lot to learn, who were, had, didn't have all their act together, but God was at work transforming them, doing really amazing things through them. Now, when you read in the New Testament, here's, don't miss this. When you read the New Testament, the, when the apostles were writing these letters to different churches and saying, hey, do this and don't do that. Why did they write, don't do that? Because they were doing that. They didn't do that because of some hypothetical, I don't, you know, somebody might eventually do that. The reason they mentioned all these different ways that we, you know, things that we shouldn't do is because some Christians were struggling doing them. Wait a minute, now you're trying to tell me the church is good and, you, and all those things they were doing? Yeah, it, it is good. And they were doing those things, but they were experiencing positive life change. In the middle of all of this, in, in a, where, the, where the cultural, oh, the shift was gigantic because we had in the same church, we would have people of different races, different socioeconomic backgrounds. We would have people, we, there were even examples where Roman soldiers became pastors of churches with Jewish members. How did that happen? Only God could make something like that happen to change the heart of people. And were they a perfect bunch of people? No, they weren't a perfect bunch of people. But when you see, you see them caring for all the different people in their church, in the community, and it's, it's really interesting too. When you read outside Christian history, when you read non-Christian ancient history, you can read instances where people who were not Christians we're kind of going, making statements about, gosh, look at how these, I don't, these crazy Christians, but look how they love one another. And you also can read cases where they're describing, hey, look, these Christians, I don't know what they're doing, but they're, even in the, they, by the way, they had pandemics back then. Even in the pandemic, they're trying to help people that are outside their own family and group. And, and they, they were kind of chastising their own people saying, well, we ought to do like they do. Christian groups back then stopped infanticide, where it was a common practice. If you had a baby, you didn't want it, you just abandoned the thing. It was a common practice in the Roman Empire. Christians went and rescued them. Christians are still rescuing babies in India right now. A friend of mine started a ministry to do that, especially Indian girls. Christians were the people that originally started hospitals to care for people, not just the wealthy, but people in general. Christians started public education to educate the masses so that they could, well, so they could read the Bible and become a Christian. Christians are groups of people that would go to people's aid. You know, somebody experiencing a natural disaster, they went to help. What Jesus had in mind was to impact the world, to change the world, through the local church. It was his idea to start the local church. It wasn't the apostle Paul. It wasn't my idea. It was Jesus' idea. And he wanted to impact the whole world through the local church, to bring people into a right relationship with him, to change their eternal destiny, and to help them with their lives right then, to make a difference in their lives right then, to help reconcile people who would it'd make no sense for them to even be in the same room together, but they became fast friends and were committed to each other. My experience with church has been great. I've had hard moments, but my experience with church has been so amazing. When I was 19, I became a Christian. About a, about a year after that, I had this feeling, I'm supposed to work in a church. I don't know, I didn't, I didn't seek that. I didn't, actually I didn't. I never even, I just all of a sudden it was there. 
And I'm going, why do I think like this? I don't know, but I somehow or another, I guess I'm, I can't shake it. It just won't go away. And so I asked someone to help me say, well, I, I, I don't know what to do. What am I supposed to do with this? And I said, I think I'm supposed to do this. Can you help me get started? And so they helped me get a job as a summer youth pastor in a church. They never, then this church was small. It was in a rural part of Louisiana. And when I got there, I, I didn't have any idea what to do. I was just a guy that had been a Christian for a year. And I just like, I'm supposed to do this and I'm willing to try. I, I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do. And these wonderful people could tell, hey, he doesn't know what to do. And so they helped me. To this day, I'm still marveled over the lady that put together a, a uh, scavenger hunt that was based on clues and it, it had to do with the local community. And so it, it, was, it was hard enough that it took a group of people a, few, a little bit of time to, okay, where, where do we go next? And they had to solve the clue and go to it. She, she, it was a marvelous thing that she did. Her gifting of putting together a scavenger hunt based on clues. And then they would help me with, you know, different events during the week. I would teach them everything I knew. Basically, whatever somebody else was teaching me, I'd turn around and teach them. But it was just a, it was just a wonderful experience. I had, a, you know, it was, it was crazy what they, the responsibility they put on me. I, to this day, I've, I'm stunned. I'm not sure they did the right thing, but here's what they did. The pastor, I remember, I'm what? Almost 20. I've been a Christian a year and the pastor decides to go on a mission trip. And he says, hey, Alan, while I'm gone, I'll be gone for two weeks. I want you to do all the speaking, visiting in the hospital, all that kind of stuff. I said, OK. And I had no idea what to do. I just did the best I could. These poor people, I hope they've recovered. But I can remember walking into the hospital room the first time someone said, hey, there's so-and-so sick in the hospital. And I, I'm just, I'm just a young guy. And I'm, I, I didn't know what to do. I, just, I was sitting there talking to myself going, you know, like, okay, what do I do when I get in there? I think they probably want me to pray, right? Okay, uh, what do I do? And so I, I, I literally had no instruction and I just started. But these people were so patient with me, they helped me get a start. And as I, as I moved from to different churches and ultimately went to seminary and then came out of seminary. My experience with these churches was just wonderful. They gave, they gave me tremendous support. Every once in a while, somebody get upset with me, but it was, it was just every once in a while. One time it was because, well, I meant well. I was leading a children's thing and I thought it'd be really cool if we could talk to God. This particular room had a empty space above it. So I put a teenager in the attic above the room. And, and so I would talk to God and God would talk back. And the kids were thought that was just, that was so phenomenal that I was able to talk to God like that. And they went home and they told their parents and their parents were saying, Hey, uh, I don't think you should try that one anymore. And they were right. You know, so but I would, I would meant well, even though I didn't, that wasn't the best move in the world. And then as I, as I got the privilege of being in more churches and some churches had, well, they had the resources that I could go anywhere I wanted to. I had, I've had literally had the privilege to go from coast to coast to visit different churches and to study the different churches and what they're doing and, and to see it. it if you could see what I've seen in terms of the churches and the impact they're having, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. So I've had this wonderful experience with churches. Now, not a one of them is perfect. The reason they're not perfect is because they're, they're full of people like me and you. And we're not perfect people. But when we make the decision to, to work together and have a healthy relationship, we can work our way through these disagreements and decide, you know what, I, okay, I don't agree with you there, but that's okay. We'll work it out. I got a phone call yesterday from a man who's 96 years old. I've told you about him before. He and I couldn't be on, well, let's put it this way. 
He is super traditional and thinks there's only one correct translation anybody should ever read. And he and I would, well, we'd have these discussions, but they were always friendly. And what he taught me was, and he made, literally, made these, he literally made this statement. He said, Alan, I'm for you when you're right. And Alan, I'm for you when you're wrong until you get right. He was for me and he still is. And so this, this guy that I haven't seen in 20 years, who's 96, called me up yesterday. And we had a great time talking. And you guess what? We still don't agree on everything. But we see we love each other. And we're, we're for each other. So you, can't, you can find bad church experiences out there. That's not hard to do. But when I started this church, by the way, 15 years ago this month, the vision was for a, a group of people that could just love each other and love God with abandon and reach the world around us, help them be brought into a right relationship with Jesus and with each other. I like what we have. I like the fact that we're so different, but yet we're still committed to one another. We're all over the place in terms of our views in terms of maybe things like politics or culture a little bit. But we're committed to each other and we love each other and we're committed to Jesus and we want to do, follow his will wherever he leads us. It's because we see the bigger picture. It's because we look in light of Jesus that we can do these things. Look, my wife and I love each other, but if we wanted to, we could find something we could have a big argument over. After being married as long as I am, if I wanted to stir things up, I would be pretty good at it at this point. I think you would be too. But we choose, we choose to work together to love one another, to care for each other. So I'm going to take you to three days after Jesus was crucified the day that he was resurrected because more happened on that day than him being resurrected in the morning. I'd like to start reading in the biography that was written by Luke. There are four biographies in the New Testament of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13, here's what it says. That same day, which is the day that he was resurrected, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, which is seven miles from Jerusalem. Average person walks what? Three, three and a half miles an hour. So that's about a two hour walk. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him for a reason. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that happened there the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a, in their mind, a prophet who did powerful miracles and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death. And they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. What are they thinking? You see, the, the, the mindset that people had back then is that when the Messiah showed up, that he was going to set up a physical kingdom, that he would literally throw off whatever enemy they had. And at that particular point, they were conquered by the Romans who were badly treating them. And so in their mind, when the Messiah shows up, he's going to have a physical kingdom. He's going to lead an army. He's going to kick the bad guys out. He's going to set up this wonderful place here on earth. And that's what they were expecting. And this all happened three days ago. Now, here, I don't know about you, but that would have gotten my attention, all the different things that happened. But what comes next really gets my attention. It says in verse 22, 
Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning. And they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and they had seen angels who had told them that Jesus is alive. Say what? So some of our men ran to see and sure enough, his body was gone just as the women had seen, had said. Now, put yourself, <laughs> okay, it's, it's that day. What are you gonna do? Okay, I'm a follower of Jesus. I saw all the miracles he did. I heard how he talked. I heard a report that he's alive. I've heard the report that some people ran to the tomb. I don't know about you. You couldn't keep me from running to that tomb. I'm going to go check this thing out. I'm going to stick around and find out if any of this is true. Not these guys. Not these guys. No. <laughs> They're just smooth, cool, moving out of town. They were deconstructing in an unhealthy way. They were walking away saying, well, uh, you know, I don't know what those women saw, but I saw Jesus on the cross. He's dead. And dead men don't come back to life. They were done. I'd like to read beginning in verse 19 one more time for a reason. What things, Jesus asked, the things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leaders and priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and they crucified him. We had hoped. He was the Messiah. They're done. They're walking away. They had this set of expectations that the Messiah would have to do. He didn't meet it. They had no clue what Jesus was really doing in the world. They didn't know. And they weren't sticking around to find out. They were, they, they're walking away from other followers, other friends. They're done. Here's what happened next. Verse 25. Then Jesus said to them, you, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. You see, when you read in Isaiah, for example, it predicts the crucifixion of Jesus. But when people read it, they just missed it. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses that's the first five books in the Bible. And all the prophets explaining all, from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I would have loved to hear that conversation. In fact, can you imagine what it would be like to hear Jesus take the entire Old Testament and explain it to you? If you're a believer, that'd have to be like, oh my goodness, that would be like the ultimate thing. I mean, if Jesus were able to, to, to show up today and he decided to do that, of course, we don't rank him showing up and doing that today. But if he did, you could hear a pin drop because you'd want to, every last thing he had to say would be so fascinating because, oh, 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 okay. You'd be going, yeah, okay, I get it now. That, that makes sense. I, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that. And so it, the whole thing would just kind of clear up for us. We'd, we'd have an idea. And so what, what is Jesus doing for them? See, they were deconstructing in a way that wasn't healthy. And so what he wanted to do is turn around and help them reconstruct in a way that was healthy. To give them the bigger picture, to help them see what was going on. I wonder if you're walking away from church, or if you're walking away from church, or if your family member is walking away from church, I wonder what Jesus would have to explain to you to help you see what he's really up to and get the bigger picture. What would you need to hear from Jesus? What is it you're confused about? What's making you want to walk away? By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. But, but Jesus acted 
as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us. I mean, would you want to talk to a guy like that? I would have, since it's getting late. So he went home with them. And as they sat down to eat, he took bread and he blessed it. Starting to sound like communion, isn't it? Then he broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Because you say, well, how could that be? Well, God can do whatever he wants to do. And at that moment, he disappeared. He can do that too. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as we talked with, as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. And there they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them. And they said, hey, the Lord has really risen and he's appeared to Peter. What a moment. What an incredible moment moment. Now, let's, let's say something that is hard to actually apply. There are points at which you should walk away from church. If a church is no longer believes in scripture, no longer has confidence in scripture and basically teaches uh, be good, do good, and ignore the Bible. And you're part of that group, and you can't influence them to head back in the right direction. It'd be appropriate for you to find a church that really does attempt to follow what Scripture reveals to us. The other thing to keep in mind is this. None of us have arrived. We're all people that are in process. At some point, I will disappoint you. It's inevitable. Sometimes I have people that come to the church and they just, they love it and they're saying, they get excited. And they say, oh, I'm so glad I found this church and we love you and we're, we're so excited about here and we we, we, and then they'll make statements about me that are inappropriate, like I'm hung the moon or something, which is definitely not the case. And, I, and I, what I'll do at that particular point is I'll, I'll do something to get their attention. I'll go, whoa. And then they're looking at me like, huh? Okay, that's weird. Why'd you do that? I want you, and then I'll say this. I want you to remember this moment. Uh, okay, why is that? And then I'll tell them because at some point in the future, I'm going to do something or say something you're not going to like. And I'd like for you to remember this moment. So let's sink it in real good. Now, guess what? It's also possible you're going to disappoint me, isn't it? Or we're going to disappoint each other. Because, see, we're, and let's be honest, the Christians, are, we're just sin-stained people that have been forgiven that we're letting God begin to work in our life to bring about positive life change. Sometimes what we want to do is Forget that what we're, what we're after is a healthy church environment. Not a perfect one. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a very famous pastor from World War II. He opposed the Nazis and the Nazis eventually killed him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this. He said, those who love their dream of Christian community more than the Christian community itself become destroyers of Christian community. I started off the message with this title. If you find a perfect church, and then dot, dot, dot. Here's the rest of it. If you find a perfect church, don't join it, because once you do, it won't be. Because we're all a bunch of imperfect people in process. But there are wonderful churches out there, and you, even if you know, you're a person checking out us online or in person and, and we're not for you. That's okay. Just find the church where God wants you to be. Because there's, a, because there's nothing as life-giving as being in a church that's trying to love each other, love God, and love the world. And to do what they can to make a difference in the people around them. It's Jesus' idea, not mine. He's the one that started the church. And he's the one that's in work in us. 
And every last one of us has issues, including me. We're all in process. But I love the process. You see, I, call, I, I refer to myself as a knucklehead pastor. I've had people say, hey, Alan, you shouldn't call yourself a knucklehead. Maybe not. I don't know. But that's what I say. And what I tell you is that my goal next year is be less of a knucklehead that, than I am right now. I'm hoping that I'll, I'll grow in my relationship with God, my love for God, my love for you, my love for others. And I'm hoping the same for you. Not that you're a knucklehead, but that you'll be growing that next year you'll be different than you are now because you did the things that can make the difference. You know what I want to be a part of? I want to be a part of whatever Jesus wants to be a part of. And Jesus is the one that established the church. It's Jesus' idea. And it's Jesus that's at work in my life right now and your life right now, whether you're in person or online. He is at work in your life. He loves you. And he's bringing about positive life change. God, I just thank you for the fact that you're at work and that, that you love the church and you gave your life for it and that you established the church and you've called us to serve in the church, that you've actually given us spiritual gifts so that we could be effective in the church. You've given every believer a gift and every believer a job in the church so that we can make a difference so we can help other people, so we can help them take next steps. I, God, it's just so exciting to think about what you've done and what you've set up and what you're continuing to do. Lord, help us just to share it with everybody. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
proclaim that I 